The title of this talk today is Consciousness in its Two Principal Aspects, Absolute and Individual, and it is divided into two parts. Today we present part two, which is subtitled Individual Consciousness. My name is William Wilson Quinn. The objective before us is to examine the spectrum, the multiple modalities or valencies of relative or individual consciousness in contrast to its related but larger subjects of absolute and cosmic consciousness. This examination rests upon the premise derived from the Philosophia Perennis that everything in the known universe is conscious, that every individual thing has some form of consciousness. This premise was articulated by H.P. Blavatsky, or H.P.B., who wrote that, quote, everything in the universe throughout all its kingdoms is conscious, i.e. endowed with a consciousness of its own kind and on its own plane of perception. We men must remember that because we do not perceive any signs which we can recognize of consciousness, say in stones, we have no right to say that no consciousness exists there." End quote. This presentation, being the second of two parts, requires some familiarity with both cosmogony and absolute consciousness in order to make it meaningful. Among the aims of this part two presentation is to compare the nature and qualities of relative or individual consciousness to absolute or universal consciousness and to identify the links of correspondence between them. Prior to an immediate embarkation into the core contents of this part two, however, it will be useful to remember two things. First, is understanding the entire context of our subject by use of various terms found in the writings of HPB and two of her teachers, the adepts Kutumi or KH and Moria. This entire context is fundamentally the commonalities and interaction between the macrocosm and microcosm, which we often find expressed as correspondences. In the writings of these initiates, we encounter the terms absolute, universal, and cosmic in descriptions of the macrocosmic perspective of consciousness. In their descriptions of the microcosmic perspective of consciousness, we encounter the terms relative, which may be perceived as the antithesis of absolute, and individual, which is not an antonym of absolute, but is usefully descriptive. The second point to understand is that we must omit any detailed discussion of human consciousness as it relates to one, the dream states, and two, to the excarnate post-mortem states from the point of death to the point of rebirth. Both of these are important topics and integral to consciousness, but their detailed treatment here would require more time than is available. We now turn to the septenary nature of individual consciousness. Just as absolute or cosmic consciousness has its septenary division, as we concluded in part one, so does relative or individual consciousness. By individual consciousness, we do not mean human consciousness, though that is a subset of individual consciousness that also has a septenary blueprint, and one to which we shall return later. What is meant here by individual consciousness is the greater emanation of consciousness within the manifested world of substance or materiality, whether inanimate or animate. As we learn from HPB, KH, and Moria, some form of individual consciousness is to be found at the atomic level as well as the molecular and the cellular levels. That all manifestation which emerges from pralaya into manvantara has this septenary design is an ancient principle. 
and one which is repeatedly affirmed throughout the writings of HPB. One such example of that is her very concise article in an 1883 issue of The Theosophist, devoted to and titled, quote, The Septenary Principle in Esotericism, end quote. The views of HPB expressed on this subject were echoed by K.H., who wrote that, quote, As man is a sevenfold being, so is the universe. The septenary microcosm being to the septenary macrocosm, but as the drop of rainwater is to the cloud from whence it dropped, and whither in the course of time it will return. End quote. While it may not be entirely accurate to view the relation of the septenary division between absolute and individual consciousness as akin to the relation between the abstract and the concrete, these last two terms nonetheless indicate a corresponding commonality regarding this relationship. More particularly, H. P. Bree wrote that, quote, the three upper are the three higher planes of consciousness, revealed and explained in both schools only to the initiates. The lower ones represent the four lower planes, the lowest being our plane or the visible universe. These seven planes correspond to the seven states of consciousness in man. End quote. Yet again, we encounter the principle and the term to correspond. The sevenfold nature of human consciousness, in other words, is in principle a septenary subset of relative or individual consciousness, and that, in turn, is a septenary subset of absolute or cosmic consciousness. This is affirmed in the same order by Moria, quote, All is one law. Man has his seven principles, the germs of which he brings with him at his birth so has a planet or a world." End quote. There is thus an unbroken line, a nexus, that runs through all levels of manifestation as a septenary pattern. It runs macro to meso to micro and returns, the one constant and recurring theme being this septenarianess. But the correspondences are just those and should not be understood as exact fractal replicas or facsimiles of one another on these various levels. While the septenary pattern is a constant, there is variation in the nature and qualities of the plane or state at issue. It is important to note in this regard that HPB carefully distinguished between the corresponding planes of individual consciousness and the states of human consciousness in her statement above. She herself emphasized these two words with italics. Following the same choice of words, planes and states, she refers in a diagram of consciousness in the sacred doctrine to, quote, the four lower planes of cosmic consciousness, the three higher planes being inaccessible to the human intellect as developed at present. The seven states of human consciousness pertain to quite another question. End quote. And so now we turn to consciousness of particles and biota. At this point in our inquiry, we arrive at what some may view as the intellectually reassuring place of empirically verifiable observations and facts regarding matter and the conscious exercise of motion within matter. Beginning at the bottom of the vertical axis of individual consciousness, we are informed by HPB that, quote, every atom and speck of matter, not of substance only, is imperishable in its essence, but not in its individual consciousness, end quote. We cannot be sure what she meant by speck of matter following the word atom in her statement but one can arguably surmise that she may have been referring to subatomic particles. Be that as it may, the atomic level is a rational point from which to begin this ascent up the vertical axis. One advantage of living in the 21st century is that humans now have powerful extensions 
to their senses in the form of microscopes and telescopes, among other things, with which to augment their empirical observations, both into atoms and subatomic particles and molecules, and into other solar systems and galaxies. And though HPB did not have access to the same powerful instruments, as a trained esotericist, she was nonetheless able to conclude that, quote, since no single atom in the entire cosmos is without life and consciousness, how much more than its mighty globes, end quote. Farther up the vertical axis of individual consciousness, one discovers subconscious subjectivity acting as the collective consciousness of molecules. In HPB's description of this, quote, there can be no manifestation of consciousness, semi-consciousness, or even unconscious purposiveness, except through the vehicle of matter. That is to say, on this our plane, wherein human consciousness in its normal state cannot soar beyond what is known as transcendental metaphysics. It is only through some molecular aggregation or fabric that spirit wells up in a stream of individual or subconscious subjectivity." End quote. Ascending above the molecular level on this vertical axis, we come to the cellular level of individual consciousness, about which HPB also writes, quote, occultism, unlike modern science, maintains that every atom of matter, when once differentiated, becomes endowed with its own kind of consciousness. Every cell in the human body, as in every animal, is endowed with its own peculiar discrimination, instinct, and speaking relatively with intelligence." End quote. Based on the foregoing statements, it is inevitable that as we ascend higher on this vertical axis of individual consciousness, where it penetrates the kingdom of biota by means of the cell, we arrive at the higher animals, including the mammalia, to which biologic class we human beings belong. It is a consistent with the notion of vertical axis that HPV uses a qualitative term, superior, to describe animal consciousness since in its ascent up the axis, it will culminate in the highest, or human, consciousness. Quote, Whereas, she writes, it is our deonic kohanic essence, which is the living, active, and potential matter, pregnant per se with that animal consciousness of a superior kind, such as, as is found in the ant and the beaver, which produces the long series of physiological differentiations." End quote. In one sense, everything to this point has been discussed and explained in this part two presentation, and perhaps including part one as well, could be said to be prefatory to the most pertinent subject under investigation, human consciousness and its own superior form spiritual consciousness. Yet this does not mean that any of the preceding foundational material should be viewed as irrelevant, since one can never achieve a full understanding of any subject without first placing it into its proper context. Nothing exists in isolation, and everything that exists has a genesis and a course of becoming interdependent with that which surrounds it. Individual consciousness is no exception to this rule. This was the teaching of HPB, who was impelled to point out that, quote, thus finding on our own plane so many and such varied states of consciousness and intelligence, we have no right to take into consideration and account only our own human consciousness, as though no other existed outside of it, end quote. So saying, we shall now turn our attention exclusively to the spiritual consciousness of human beings and then conclude this discussion with emphasis on those who tread the higher spiritual path and their revered teachers.
human consciousness and brain mind. In examining the nature and function of the human brain and mind, it is always useful to remember the exhortation of the Buddha regarding impermanence, that the only constant in our existence within samsara is impermanence or change. The application of the Buddha's teaching to our subject here compels an acknowledgement and perpetual mindfulness that the human being is an evolutionary work in progress. So, as we continue to learn, we must maintain an awareness that our brains and minds are currently somewhere in the middle of their ultimate cyclic development as that pertains to certain evolutionary cycles within cycles of extraordinary duration. Whatever we may now say about human cognition and consciousness only applies to our present stage of development. According to HPB, at this point in time, individual human consciousness is comprised of, quote, seven states of consciousness, which are, one, waking, two, waking dreaming, three, natural sleeping, four, induced or trance sleep, five, psychic, six, super psychic, and seven, purely spiritual, all of which correspond with one of the seven cosmic planes of consciousness. Among the perspectives that separate the esotericist and the secular humanist, for example, is whether the brain or the consciousness is a priori. For the esotericist, the conclusion is simple. First, there is spirit, Brahman, Atman, then intelligence or mind, Mahat, then consciousness, Prajna, and self-consciousness, Ahamkara, and then the brain. Secular humanists and others hold that just the reverse is the proper order, that mind and consciousness, excluding altogether the spirit, are essentially epiphenomena of the brain, which is first. The esoteric perspective was stated by K.H. when he wrote that, quote, we do not bow our heads in the dust before the mystery of mind, for we have solved it ages ago. Rejecting with contempt the theistic theory, we reject as much the automaton theory, teaching that states of consciousness are produced by the marshalling of the molecules of the brain." End quote. HPB was similarly adamant in scorning the high priests of science, as she says, and as she described them, of the late 19th century, for seeking simply to, quote, resolve consciousness into a secretion from the gray matter of the brain, end quote. The true simplicity of the spirit, atma, versus mind, mahat, the true simplicity of that debate about priority was captured by Ananda K. Kumaraswamy in his repeated criticism of the materialist view contained in Rene Descartes' axiom, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Kumaraswamy called this axiom a non sequitur and sought to correct it by a rearranging the words as sum ergo cogito, I am, therefore I think, with the emphasis being on the first I as the spiritual atma, reflecting the ancient maxim, I am that, in Sanskrit, soham. The human brain, while it is the only physical organ associated with the non-physical mind and consciousness, yet plays a role in understanding the latter. Different parts of the physical brain are responsible for different functions, and HPB makes special mention of the pineal gland, which produces a serotonin-derived hormone called melatonin. She asserts that, quote, the special organ of consciousness is of course the brain and is located in the aura of the pineal gland in the living man, end quote. And speaking esoterically, not anatomically, 
She adds that, at least during the incarnate existence of the person, the, quote, pineal gland is in truth the very seat of the highest and divinest consciousness in man, his omniscient, spiritual, and all-embracing mind, end quote. That being the case, then the other process, the ordinary rational thought, would normally occur in the frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex, which performs functions like language, reasoning, and practical cognition. This separation of the primary operations of human consciousness linked to two different locations of the physical brain strongly suggests a corresponding bifurcation inherent in a core doctrine of the seven principles of the human being, of which the three highest are the seventh or atma, the spirit, the sixth or buddhi, intuition, and the fifth or manas, the mind, in their Sanskrit names. This core doctrine pertains to a bifurcation in the last of these three principles, manas or mind, into one ordinary or rational thought, known as the manas or manas rupa, that is formal or lower mind, and two, abstract or spiritual thought, known as the manas arupa, formless or higher mind. These two aspects of manas being separated by a subtle divide known in Sanskrit as the antakarana. This dual operation of the brain function, pineal gland and frontal lobe, is further reflected in a dual operation of human consciousness, or as HBB phrased it, a double consciousness. As to the ordinary and rational waking consciousness, HPB explains that, quote, the brain self is real while it lasts and weaves its karma as a responsible entity. Esoterically explained, it is the consciousness inhering in that lower portion of the manas, which is correlated with the physical brain, end quote. She refers to this lower type of human consciousness as sentient consciousness and contrasts it to the spiritual consciousness. The sentient consciousness is derived from, as she says, the lower manasic light, or the manas rupa, which dies with the body at death, while the spiritual consciousness is derived from the manas, as she says, illuminated by the light of buddhi, or the manas arupa, which survives the death of the body. As HBB further explained, quote, there is a spiritual consciousness, the manasic mind illuminated by the light of buddhi, that which subjectively perceives abstractions, and the sentient consciousness, the lower manasic light, inseparable from our physical brain and senses. This latter consciousness is held in subjection by the brain and physical senses, and, being in its turn equally dependent on them, must, of course, fade out and finally die with the disappearance of the brain and physical senses." End quote. In addition to the terms sentient consciousness and spiritual consciousness, HPB uses here, she also used two other terms to describe the same attributes of the human in various places throughout her writings. Those terms are, respectively, the manas kama and the manas buddhi, indicating the proximity of the lower mind or manas rupa to the kama immediately below it, being emotion, desire, and volition and the proximity of the higher mind, or manas arupa, to the buddhi immediately above it, being intuition. The death of the incarnate individual, human being, marks the end of that person's sentient consciousness, since the brain, including its pineal gland, dies with the physical body. It is, to state another way, the departure of the phenomenally based consciousness of the mortal manas rupa from the noumenally based consciousness of the surviving manasa rupa bound to the buddhi and its immortal atma.
by necessity. This leaves remaining only the spiritual consciousness of the human being, the Atma Buddhi Manasa Rupa, or the monad, which shall be from this point onward the focus of our discussion. This is because, quote, the ideas about the infinite and the absolute are not, nor can they be, within our brain capacities. They can be faithfully mirrored only by our spiritual consciousness, end quote. Moreover, such spiritual ideas and concepts within whose circumference we find the attribute of self-consciousness would similarly be mirrored by our spiritual consciousness. Quote, For in the act of self-analysis, HPB wrote, the mind becomes in its turn an object to the spiritual consciousness. It is the overshadowing of the mind by buddhi which results in the ultimate realization of existence. In other words, self-consciousness in its purest form. End quote. And now we turn to the topics of meditation and samadhi. Among several ways one may achieve, quote, realization of existence, end quote, is through balancing of karmic equities by which one attains liberation from the wheel of death and rebirth, or through complete and permanent overshadowing of one's fifth principle manas, or mind by the sixth principle, or buddhi, as suggested above, or through reintegration of one's individual consciousness with the cosmic consciousness. Whether these are all different ways to describe the same achievement, or are differing nuances in approach to affect this achievement, is left to each person to discern. But such differences point to the existence of multiple schools of yoga and spiritual practices within the Philosophia Perennis, or Theosophia, dating back millennia, that practice different methods and techniques to attain enlightenment or liberation. These schools of higher yoga and spiritual practice, together with traditions or branches of esotericism within all the world's major religions, collectively provide multiple spiritual paths, which at their advanced levels, eventually merge into a uniform initiatic path. What is central to virtually all these schools and traditions is some form of contemplative meditation, usually as a daily practice of gradual mastery of the mind through focused concentration by a calm application of the will. Meditation is universally key to advancement upon the higher spiritual path and to the expansion of consciousness. Culturally infused meditative practices of the East, such as Zazen of the Mahayana Zen Buddhist schools, including those of China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, or Vipassana of the Theravada Buddhist forest traditions, or Lojong of the Vajrayana Buddhists, or classical Raja Yoga of traditional Hinduism, all have in our time become global. Occasionally, these practices are conflated with sitting while reciting mantras, or japa, as in Hinduism, or with the practice of dhikr among Islamic Sufis, or even with the practice of repeated recitations in Christian hesychism. These recitative practices are sometimes conflated with prayer, which is not meditation, even though these terms are somewhat sometimes used together as if they are related practices. It may be true that genuinely meditative Eastern practices can be points of entry to meditation for those in the West. But we believe it is preferable to take a purely sacred science and non-denominational approach to the subject of meditation and discuss it in terms of the seven principles of human beings particularly as to the Atma, the seventh principle, the Buddhi, the sixth principle, and the Manas Arupa, the higher fifth principle. <laughs>
Without planning to do so, HBB virtually defined the method of meditation in sacred science terms by her quote above, when she stated that, quote, it is the overshadowing of the mind by buddhi which results in the ultimate realization of existence, end quote. To clarify this statement as applied to meditation, we can respectfully add that it is the intentional objective of overshadowing the manas, or fifth principle of the practitioner, by the buddhi, or sixth principle, that eventually leads, through daily practice, to deep and prolonged meditative states, resulting in, as HPB phrased it, ultimate realization of existence. This practice involves the gentle stilling of all lower mental activity, followed by a sustained concentrated focus upon a single point of a higher spiritual significance, which, stated alternatively, amounts to a sublimation of sentient consciousness by the spiritual consciousness, to use HPB's terms. Among the initiates and adepts of her order, Meditation is understood and acknowledged as an ancient and indispensable practice for spiritual development and progress upon the higher spiritual path. As K.H. noted, quote, Fasting, meditation, chastity of thought, word, and deed, silence for certain periods of time to enable nature herself to speak to him who comes to her for information, end quote. These will allow the spiritual aspirants to achieve illumination. And, turning to Buddhism, this same adept quoted the Theravadan Mahabhaga of the Khandaka, quote, When the real nature of things becomes clear to the meditating bhikshu, then all his doubts fade away since he has learned what is that nature and what its cause." End quote. K.H. then added to this a comment of his own. Quote, Meditation here means the superhuman, not supernatural, qualities or arhatship in its highest of spiritual powers. End quote. It should not be surprising that in relation to other world religions, Buddhism is so often consulted in inquiries about meditation, or for that matter, about consciousness. It is fair to say, in explanation of this tendency, that no other religion equals or approximates the level of discourse about meditation, as is found in Buddhist scriptures. This fact may now introduce the Buddhist jhana states of meditation, or more accurately, of consciousness. The descriptions of these states represent early examples of the principle of the vertical axis of consciousness, which ascends from lower to higher and to the highest. Repeated in a number of the early suttas of the Pali Canon, the jhana states are the hierarchical meditative planes reached by advanced practitioners of meditation which effectively describe expansion of awareness or consciousness. Among those suttas, most often quoted is the Samyutta Nikaya 45.8, which reads as follows, quote, And what, monks, is right concentration? Here, monks, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thought and examination with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. With the subsiding of thought and examination, he enters and dwells in the second jhana, which has internal confidence and unification of mind, is without thought and examination, and has rapture and happiness born of concentration. With fading away as well as rapture, he dwells in equanimity, and mindful and clearly comprehending, he experiences happiness within the body, 
he enters and dwells in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, he is equanimous, mindful, one who dwells happily. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous passing way of joy and dejection, he enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither painful nor pleasant, and includes the purification of mindfulness and equanimity." End quote. This text is an explication of one feature of the Eightfold Path in Buddhism, being right concentration, or in some translations, right meditation, which relates to the last or fourth of the Four Noble Truths of the Buddha. What should be understood is that no bright or clear lines exist between these jhana states that the practitioner encounters in meditation. Rather, they should be understood as truth of the existence of higher and more subtle levels of one's inner journey as the wayfarer progresses in meditation and, for that matter, on the higher spiritual path. The pinnacle of meditation and spiritual development generally can be conceived by the Sanskrit word samadhi, whose detailed explanation can be found in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. This state of elevated consciousness is not easy to describe, surpassing as it does the conceptions of the rational mind and the vocabulary that mind uses. But we attempt to do so nonetheless by using the words of HPB above with slight modification. She refers to the overshadowing of the manas or mind, the fifth principle of the practitioner, by the buddhi or intuition of the sixth principle. And when this occurs through sustained discipline and will by the practitioner, both these principles, the fifth and the sixth, mind and intuition, are effectively illuminated by the divine emanations of the seventh principle, the spiritual atma within. When the mind is at last in alignment with the buddhi, then can the mind be illuminated or enlightened by the immortal atma. This is the ultimate state of samadhi. At the same time, it is an illumination of the human consciousness. Stated alternatively, quote, it is, when correctly interpreted in one sense, the divine self perceived or seen by self, the Atman or seventh principle, ridded of its biotic distinction from its universal source, which becomes the object of perception for and by the individuality centered in buddhi, the sixth principle, something that happens only in the highest state of samadhi." End quote. And this statement by K.H. is affirmed by H.P.B. when discussing Plotinus's definition of real ecstasy as, quote, the liberation of the mind from its finite consciousness becoming one and identified with the infinite, end quote. And adding, in her own words, quote, it is indeed identical with that state which is known in India as samadhi, end quote. And now to reintegration of consciousness. We now arrive at the end of part two of this presentation by looking back to the beginning of part one and again citing an axiom from the works of HPB. Quote, individual consciousness emanates from and returns into absolute consciousness, which is eternal motion, end quote. The effect of reaching the state of samadhi, or if one prefers spiritual enlightenment or liberation from the wheel of death and rebirth, is crossing the bridge that connects and allows a return to absolute consciousness from individual consciousness. It is full circle. It is where the head of the Ouroboros 
meets its tail in the endless spiral of eternal motion. But for the individual human being who has attained or achieved this high, highest level, which allows a permanent reintegration of individual consciousness back into absolute or cosmic consciousness, there remains a choice. This choice is whether to release that individual consciousness back into the cosmic consciousness, described so eloquently by Edwin Arnold as, quote, the dewdrop slips into the shining sea, end quote. Or, instead, to defer this reintegration and continue incarnate as a conscious light bringer on behalf of humanity. This latter is the path of the bodhisattva, where the initiate learns to transfer his or her individual consciousness unbroken from birth to rebirth. As HPB explains, quote, those alone whom we call adepts, who know how to direct their mental vision and to transfer their consciousnesses, physical and psychic both, to other planes of being, are able to speak with authority on such subjects." End quote. Thus is one's individual and illuminated consciousness put to practical use for the benefit of humanity in order to assist in the sacred mission of the association of adepts, which mission is none other than the spiritual enlightenment of humanity as a whole. In this endeavor, a new bodhisattva, likely an initiate in that order or association, learns to, quote, become exempt from the curse of unconscious transmigration, end quote. Once this ability is mastered, the initiate then has, quote, complete or true immortality, which means an unlimited sentient existence that can have no breaks or stoppages, no arrest of self-consciousness, end quote. In the same context, HPB writes that, quote, immortality is but one's unbroken consciousness, end quote. This individual unbroken consciousness, intentionally not reintegrated into the cosmic consciousness, is now present in a person who has compassionately sacrificed this reintegration and the eternal bliss that accompanies it. Serving the needs of humanity in this way, of such a person it can be said, quote, immortal then is he, and the pan-aeonic immortality whose distinct consciousness and perception of self under whatever form undergoes no disjunction at any time, not for one second, during the period of his egoship. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Bill, for such a wonderful lecture, presentation. Uh, Tim, would you like to say something? We are opening for questions now. Right. Yes. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Erica. And thank you, uh, Bill, for a very insightful uh, discussion, really, of something which is so difficult to uh, quantify and which science really has so far failed to do it. The, the other week, we, we had a very interesting talk from Eddie Bellamoria, and, and he went through the, the various ridiculous assertions that science makes when it comes to trying to define consciousness. I'd like to ask you whether you think that there is slowly dawning in the world of supposed rationality and science, a deeper understanding that consciousness isn't just confined to um, our brains and to flesh and bone, but is something much wider than that. Are, are you optimistic that this view is somehow being more widely accepted by a greater number of people and indeed within the world of, of science and technology itself. Um, yes, thank you, Tim, for the question. 
Um, every, can everyone hear me? Am I coming through? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. Um, actually, Tim, I'm I'm actually quite encouraged by uh, the evidence that abounds in in our modern world with respect to the merging of science as a whole and uh, spirituality. And uh, just recently, uh, some of you may have seen uh, a really outstanding presentation about the uh, connection between the uh, uh, physicist David Bohm and Krishnamurti, Jadu Krishnamurti, um, where it appears that um, much of Krishnamurti's view, which is a spiritual view, was uh, either incorporated by or corroborated by David Bohm in some of his uh, um, theories and perceptions about physics and uh, uh, theoretical physics, astrophysics, and uh, the creation of the universe and the evolution of the universe, the, the evolving of the universe. And this was just, you know, the most recent. I mean, this began, I don't, I don't know when it began uh, as a trend in modern science, but you may recall a book called uh, the, the Tao of uh, Physics by a fellow named Freak Jeff Capra. This was some years ago, actually some decades ago, if I'm not mistaken. And since that, that seemed to be the, one of the big icebreakers of, of uh, this notion that um, modern science is now, at least at the higher levels of it, is now embracing a, a more um, theosophical, spiritual view of things. I wouldn't call it a religious view, but it would certainly be a theosophical, spiritual view of things. And I mean, even going back even to Albert Einstein, who, who was a great champion of the intuition and, and uh, viewed a lot of, and I attributed a lot of his discoveries to his intuitive abilities. So, you know, slowly and surely since probably the mid 19th or 20th century, it has been growing and I expect it to keep growing. So I don't know if that responds to your question, Tim, but that's my view of things. Yes, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, it does answer my question very well. Thank you. Yes, there is a question for you, Bill, in the chat. Um, I have to wear my glasses to read it. It says, excellent lecture with much to mull over. I have one question. Does the pineal gland remain dormant an entire life lifetime if not uh, activated by meditation well i have to confess <laughs> i'm not a neurologist so I, i'm not sure that i'm qualified to answer that um, although i expect that there is a reciprocity between the activity of the pineal gland and daily meditation you know, I can't confirm that, but I, I have a sense that there is a reciprocity so that uh, I expect a daily meditation might have some positive effect on the pineal, on the activity of the pineal gland. Uh, and and, and there would, so there would be a reciprocity there, but I, but I can't confirm it. I'm not a neurologist. Thank you, Bill. As, as Tim mentioned, uh, David Bone and Krishnamurti, I would like to say that Orlando Fernandez will be presenting a lecture in December, and he has a PhD in David Bone and esotericism. He's a doctor on the subject. So he will be introducing for us David Bone philosophy, uh, the relation of his worldview to esotericism and Krishnamurti. Now, I do have a question. Please remember, if you have a question, you have to raise your hand in the, in the chat. For those who do not know how to raise the hand, you have to ask questions, uh, to, write, to write the question in the chat. And if you do not know to do that either, please ask the word and then we'll give it to you. Bill, I have a question. You mentioned the seven states of consciousness that HPB refers to. I think I think she mentions that on her works, her, her work on dreams. Is that so? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. She has works on what? On her work on dreams. Oh, dreams. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think I I sort of uh, I, I I gave myself a little bit of an escape at the beginning of the lecture by saying that I that 
I was sort of avoiding the, the dream states and the uh, post-mortem states because that those are rather sizable topics in and of themselves as it relates to consciousness. But it's true that HPB does have a lot of material in her writings, or at least a, a good amount of material in her writings about the dream, about dreams and dream states. And she identifies uh, one of the, the uh, seven states of consciousness as the, as the dream state. So uh, uh, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't go in. I mean, I, I wish I could give you a, a, a better explication of dream interpretation and the, uh, the relation between the dream states and the waking consciousness or the other states of consciousness, but I, I'm not equipped to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and just a last question. Um, when um, you gave us this uh, seven states of consciousness, which HPB refers to, how would you relate them to the seven, pri seven principles? Seven principles. Yeah. Yes. I, well, that, that's a novel question for me. I mean, usually I would just start with the, the grossest and, and go up to the finest levels and then see if uh, there's a, a correlation between those uh, and, and uh, not. I mean, I think probably the dream states would, would correspond maybe to the fourth and lower fifth uh, principles. Come on, us. yeah. Yeah, um, but then on the other hand, you know, when, when some of us sleep, uh, we actually use our higher principles in uh, our travels during sleep. So uh, there, for a lot of people, there's, a, there's not a clear distinction between the, the actual dream states of the mind and the activities of the, of the higher principles in, in uh, traveling uh, during the, those times. So that, that's a very tricky uh, area there, trying to discern between those two uh, activities at night. Thank you, Bill. Um, I think there is another question here in the chat from Vimala. Why don't you use the, ma the mic and ask your question, please? It, it isn't so much a question as just that um, Bill was saying how um, consciousness is, is rising more. And I, I actually think COVID has a lot to do with this as well. Um, it's forcing people to think differently. But what I put in the chat is um, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who is a quantum physicist and neuroscientist, is actually proving with brain scans on Buddhist meditators, monks, and, and also ordinary people. He can show when their brain is in bliss consciousness. And he said they must be the happiest people on the earth, these Buddhist monks, because they're uh, now he's bringing the East and the West together. He's proving a lot of the Eastern teachings. So I just thought it was interesting mm. to uh, mm. point that out because you were discussing science and consciousness. Yes, thank you. I, 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 I would like to be more familiar with that work, but I, I am aware that, the, that there have been studies on uh, the brain waves from alpha, beta, gamma, and the various other deeper mm -hmm. waves mm -hmm. for, for many years, in fact, for decades. And yeah, a lot of yeah. and this uh, science called biofeedback, you know, a lot of, a lot of people have been, uh, a lot of scientists have been uh, investigating in these. And yeah. I think we're getting well, better information all the time. It's, it's more than that. He's actually, people have actually been in his seminars and they've been in wheelchairs, and different states of Ill, Ill health and all sorts of things, psychiatric problems. And he teaches you how to go from your ordinary, what, what does he call his book? Um, breaking the habit of being yourself because all these things are in the old self, in the brain and in our minds of things. But he teaches you through meditation to go beyond all that and you can get out of a lot of that. It's, it's very fascinating stuff, mm -hmm. very fascinating stuff. Yeah. Thank you. One thing you said, which really came to me, is um, a quote I read, which you, you've just mentioned, not the quote, but something similar. And it says, I, as in the I, don't see the self. The self itself sees the self in the self. 
So no. the little eye doesn't see the self, but the bigger no. self sees itself no. in the self. Yeah. No. So it's similar to what you've been saying a lot of that. It was wonderful talk and so much great information. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Vimala. Do we have any other question? Or there is silence? Yes, I know it's a difficult subject. I know that it's difficult. Um, uh, Tim, there is a comment by Ted Fish. He's saying, um, well, he, well, basically this is a comment for me, so I'm not gonna read. He's just asking where I can, he can find the first video. The first video of the first part of the lecture is online on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Uh, Bill, I, I have perhaps the last question for you. Um, what you found most interesting in this study on consciousness based on HPB's writings? What was that which you came across that you found especially interesting? Could you share with us, please? Well, you know, in, in researching uh, the preparation for these lectures, I, 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 I covered a lot of ground, old ground that I had, you know, studied for many years. But what came back to me in a, in a rather sizable uh, uh, sort of rediscovery, or, or I don't know, I, I absorbed it better, was this notion that there, there is nothing, literally nothing in the universe that does not have some form of consciousness. Because it, it really is, it, it, it gets down to the question of motion, that, that where you find motion, that there is some degree of activity and therefore some degree of consciousness, however dim that may be. And when you, when you think about the fact that motion can be defined by the uh, uh, protons and electrons moving around the nucleus of an atom, something that small, then you find that there's, there's virtually consciousness everywhere. In other words, the entire universe is one big breathing conscious entity. And that's, that's what sort of struck me as a, as a sort of, uh, I don't know, was the, the comprehensive uh, effect of, of doing this research again. So, you know, that, that now I, I, I'm a lot more careful when I walk down the, the sidewalk about stepping on anything that might be conscious and living, which is, which includes about everything. So, you know, it, it makes, it makes one more sensitive to one's surroundings in, in a major way. That's, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you, it does. Uh, we have the last question there in the chat by Carlos Navajo. He's asking, how about the persons that reincarnate with uh, their former uh, consciousness? I mean, people that remember their former lives. Yes, yes, right, right. Well, I mean, first of all, that is a very, very select group of people. I mean, that's a very, that's a very rare ability to, in other words, to transfer bodies, whether from uh, one adult body to another adult body or through the birth process and maintain the consciousness of one's to maintain self-consciousness and uh, expanded consciousness. That's, that's, uh, th these are abilities that are reserved to those who are high initiates, basically. But that does occur according to HBB and KH. You know, there's the, the, that notion of the, uh, the Tibetan term, Chang Chub, which is somebody who, who in the practice, remember we did, we had this discussion in, in Death and Dying, Memento Mori, about the notion about um, about uh, the pawa, the the Tibetan notion of pawa, which is the transference of consciousness just before death, from one body to another or one state of being to another. So that's a very uh, rarefied uh, group, but yes, it does occur and it is able. And people, some of those individuals are able to do that through both methods from from existing body to existing body or through the birth process to maintain an unbroken consciousness throughout that process. 